today we actually have a lineup that I think you're really going to be excited to hear um, because they're going to be sharing e economic resources for expansion for actually um, individual entrepreneurs, um, nonprofits, cities, and businesses. And um, you know that's really essential as we our communities work to emerge from the pandemic. Um, so we have on tap for you today um, individuals from the Economic Development Administration, or short for EDA. We also have um, um, a presenter from the Small Business Administration, or SBA. And those initials will become very um, important and um, ones that you will remember. Um, for the EDA, we actually have the Director of the Economic Development Integration, um, division, Doug Lynott, and Nancy Gilbert is also working with him today. She's a program analyst in the Economic Development Integration Group. And then for SBA, we actually have Heather Luzzi. She's the district director for the Sacramento District. And these are, you know, when you, when, as I mentioned, um, these are the individuals who have the resources um, that are really excited um, and that's what this, this entire convening is about, getting those resources out to you. So in the words of Arby's, we got the money. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to the EDA team to start us off. Good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, Michael, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Julius, thank you. Uh, our thanks to you and to the Sacramento Promise Zone for hosting this week's convening. Uh, we're very excited to participate. Uh, my name is Doug Lynott, and I'm the director of the Division of Economic Development Integration at EDA headquarters in Washington. I am also a former Arby's employee, so uh, certainly a tip of the hat to Michael for that reference. Thank you. Um, we're excited to be able to share some information with you today. Uh, Nancy Gilbert is the senior program analyst with the integration team here at headquarters. And the, so the two of us uh, have a great deal of information that we want to share. And so without further ado, let me just quickly do the uh, share screen function and start our slide presentation. Okay, um, is the is this coming in uh, clearly for everybody? Yes. Yes, okay. So uh, let's proceed. Here's a basic overview of uh, the presentation and electronic copies of these slides will be made available for everybody. So I won't focus on that and instead, what I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes doing with, the, uh, with folks as we get started is to um, define the terminology we're using in the context of EDA's programs and today's uh, presentations and panel. Uh, economic stability, as it turns out, is a term that is uh, commonly used in the world of economics, but it's also uh, one that is complex and we could probably each enroll in an institution of higher education to earn our doctorate uh, studying this particular aspect of economic policy. Uh, since we don't have that kind of time available uh, today, I would like to just um, focus on the aspect of the word or the term stability as it relates to um, you know, ec the economic concerns that we all hold in common and uh, EDA's programs and resources, and that is uh, the strength to stand or endure. And furthermore, in, in the context of today's discussion, in the context of the programs that we administer and uh, who we aspire to serve, uh, I'd like to further uh, specify that uh, this pertains to you know, regional economies, uh, local economies, as well as to the economic stability of our, our neighborhoods and our households. So that's just a little uh, context setting uh, for everybody here. And with that in mind, let's spend a few minutes kind of learning about uh, EDA's mission 
And some of the investment priorities that EDA uses and that are directly uh, relevant to the theme of economic stability. So uh, many of you may not know that EDA is the sole federal agency in the United States federal government with the singular mission uh, to support economic development, local and regional economic development. And the mission of our agency is to lead the federal economic development agenda by promoting innovation and competitiveness and preparing American regions for growth and success in the worldwide economy. Uh, these three investment priorities that you see here are three out of seven total uh, separate investment priorities that EDA uses among its various uh, criteria for evaluating applications for grant assistance. And I would uh, like to just kind of highlight these with respect to the type of economic stability we're discussing today, the economic stability of regional and local economies, uh, neighborhoods, and individual households. Uh, as we are all very aware now under the administration, uh, equity is a theme that is getting a great deal of attention and is a priority here at EDA, um, as well as across the federal landscape. Uh, within EDA, this investment priority is described as economic development planning or implementation projects that advance equity across America through investments that directly benefit one or more traditionally underserved populations. And this includes, but is not limited to women, uh, Black households and communities, Latino and Indigenous and Native American persons, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, or to underserved uh, communities within geographies that have been systemically uh, and or uh, systemically denied a full opportunity to participate in aspects of economic prosperity. So uh, the, this particular investment priority was established just this past spring, April of uh, 2021 and is EDA's first investment priority. So it's number one on this list, but it's also number one on EDA's overall list of seven priorities and is uh, kind of uh, the North Star that EDA is now using to evaluate project applications and to make a concerted effort to ensure that the investments that EDA makes uh, generate benefits and various other outcomes that uh, are equitable in terms of who they reach. Uh, recovery and resilience. Uh, EDA defines this as economic, economic development planning or implementation projects that build economic resilience to and long term, to long term recovery uh, from economic shocks like those experienced by the closure of uh, coal and power plants and other uh, central organizations that uh, drive regional economies. So this is definitely one that speaks directly to the theme of stability. And then workforce development, these are um, planning and implementation projects that support workforce education and skills, uh, training activities directly connected to the hiring and skills needed um, by the business community and result in uh, family supporting uh, positions for households in American communities and regions. These programs here that you see on this next slide are but a handful of EDA's total portfolio, but are the ones that are most germane with respect to the kinds of projects and activities I was just describing, implementation projects, strategic planning, so economic adjustment assistance is a highly flexible program that can be used to fund a variety of activities and provide gap financing um, that is not available through the uh, private sector. Public works, as the name suggests, uh, supports primarily infrastructure types of projects, new construction, as well as rehabilitation and reconstruction. And then technical assistance is uh, capacity building resource that EDA makes available as well. Uh, the 
link to EDA's program website is available on this slide and everybody is invited to um, open that page and uh, find out more about what these projects are capable of doing and how they can be used. The Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy or SEDS uh, process under EDA is really the cornerstone to any of the types of projects and activities that I've just uh, spent a brief time describing. Uh, this process, this method uh, developed by EDA is primarily uh, managed and implemented by economic development districts. Uh, these are designated by EDA and cover the majority of counties uh, across the United States. And eligibility for implementation projects and grants uh, is premised in part on the relationship between the project and the um, regional SEDS. And so this is really the roadmap that regions use to uh, conduct the analysis upon which uh, priorities are established and projects are identified to bring to life uh, the region's vision for economic growth and economic participation. So um, speaking of st uh, stability, we, we've created this basic model to describe or illustrate um, how the integration practice kind of fits within EDA. And since uh, stability was the theme of the presentation, I thought that somehow this might slightly resemble um, uh, an atom. And so kind of uh, very loosely and maybe lamely uh, using that metaphor, uh, you'll see that the nucleus talks about coordinated investments that support resilient economies. And the neutrons, protons, and electrons orbiting this nucleus are uh, the contributions that our team helps uh, to make on behalf of uh, our communities and regions uh, to meet that objective, the coordinated investment. So we support uh, capacity and access to federal and other economic development resources. We uh, facilitate and help plan um, collaboration across federal agencies and across intergovernmental and, and cross-sector partners. Um, <clears throat> We help to align uh, various resources with the project priorities that are identified at the local and regional level. And this is really all of the work that leads up to um, the optimized investments, making those investments in coordination with each other that result in uh, much bigger benefit and uh, better results for the regional economy. There are some basic methods that we've developed in order to uh, bring all of this to life. Uh, we call these integration events. We are leveraging EDA's uh, historic uh, capacity to convene uh, stakeholders uh, from various federal agencies and also local and regional uh, governments and organizations. And within the economic development integration practice, uh, we have two primary methods. One is the Federal Interagency Resource Exchange, or FIRE, which is really a relationship building event and the exchange of information between local and regional stakeholders and federal uh, government uh, program staff. Regional Economic Diversification Summits, uh, this is actually a process. The kickoff is the summit itself and the entire process is intended to again, bring those same uh, participants and partners together for the more specific purpose of uh, working together to implement specific strategic and interrelated economic uh, development projects uh, according to the regional SEDS. So uh, having said all that, um, I'd like to invite Nancy to join the conversation. She's going to pick up the baton and say a few more words about these integration events and then pivot into some of EDA's more recent resources under the American Rescue Plan. 
so thanks again. And uh, Nancy, please take it away. Sure. Thanks, Doug. And, and thank you for continuing to, to drive. One of the integration events that we did want to focus on here is something that we're calling a Federal Interagency Resource Exchange or FIRE event. And this is where EDA can use its convening capacity to bring together our federal partners to help communities um, take a look at the array of federal funding that is available. And, and in this environment right now, in response to the pandemic, there certainly are more federal funds available. And these can be a really helpful way in which um, our federal family can come together and help communities sort through these different resources and identify the ones that make the most sense for your community. So this is something that would be um, engaged in at EDA with our uh, state uh, economic development representatives and also our regional economic development integrators. So in the Sacramento area, for example, that would be Melinda Madsen. She's the um, EDA economic development representative that many of you know and would be working with um, organizations like the one we're gonna hear from next, uh, the district director for SBA. So on the next slide, um, this is, uh, once you get past sort of understanding what those resources are, we also have convened communities to dig into how do we get these uh, resources to affect the projects that we specifically want to do as a community. And that's um, a different level of convening and we call this a regional economic diversification summit. There's one going on tomorrow in Goldendale, Washington that our Seattle regional integrator is organizing and she's gonna speak to you on Friday about projects like that. This is where we can really um, have more of a workshop setting where uh, communities can come together to talk about their goals and how these resources can map or match to those projects. So um, it really does build enhanced collaboration. We're hoping to uh, increase access and therefore reduce the burden of uh, trying to figure out which of these programs and projects uh, match each other the best. It helps to optimize that resource alignment and establish um, an action plan for moving forward faster. So we have some examples of this on our website and the link is there. So Doug, next slide. Um, one of the things that we did wanna highlight for you as the pandemic has disrupted economies across the country, um, there have been some uh, additional resources that you were glad to implement um, under the American Rescue Plan Act and EDA received $3 billion of new funding, which is about 10 times our normal grant uh, amount. And we have um, organized this into six programs uh, that um, now have funding opportunities available for you. So I want to highlight, um, all of them are highlighted here. Uh, if you move to the next slide, this is really a quick summary of what those are. So right now states uh, have received funding to do statewide recovery planning. Uh, and we also have some resources available to just help us to review the research uh, as we go along, uh, real-time research on how we're implementing these programs under a research and networks opportunity. Um, we have dedicated funding that was set aside in the legislation for travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation. These are sectors that were heavily impacted by the pandemic and there are resources available for that. Doug mentioned the Economic Adjustment Assistance Program. That's one of our core programs, but we have $500 million in additional funding available through that to communities. Um, and this is a way in which we can fund things like revolving loan funds. Uh, we capitalize those. It can be planning, it can be infrastructure, it can be construction, it can be non-construction, it can be workforce development. This is really our flexible funding program. We've set aside $100 million for indigenous communities, again, understanding that some communities have been really devastated by the pandemic and their economies need uh, both capacity building and hard infrastructure, soft infrastructure. So that, um, that funding is available now. And lastly, um, we have a good jobs challenge, which is where we are looking to build industry partnerships uh, in different sectors around the country so that those sectoral workforce training systems have the capacity they need to uh, bring um, the communities along with the talent that they need to uh, really engage in sort of that good quality jobs that are uh, jobs above the prevailing range in these uh, communities. So that um, is another national competition that has um, a deadline in January. The rest of these fundings uh, are primarily rolling funds. But I do wanna focus on, um, if you move to the next slide, 
on the eligible applicants for these, uh, just to make sure that all of you know that EDAs, applicants who can receive these funds are um, district organizations. These are partners that we work with on the SEDS that Doug mentioned. Um, these are economic development districts. Indian tribes, as I mentioned, states, counties, cities, and other political subdivisions. These are your um, government agencies. Institutions of higher education, this can include community colleges and universities. And of course, public and private nonprofit organizations that are working with these local government partners on economic development strategies. So all of these are our eligible applicants. We do not fund individuals or for-profit institutions, but we do have a wide range of economic development um, stakeholders that we can fund with our projects. Next slide. Um, the one opportunity we did wanna highlight for you is the biggest one that we have under the American Rescue Plan Act. It's a $1 billion Build Back Better Regional Challenge. This is a industry clusters uh, initiative. So it is going to uh, support regional growth clusters, which build on the competitive assets of each region across the country. Uh, and we have a group of projects that we can fund in those areas that can be each individual project can be $750,000 up to uh, $25 million, even if that makes sense uh, for the project. We're looking for a group of three to eight projects in each region so that we can really invest those deep resources in a variety of projects that will really supercharge the economy um, around an industry cluster. This is being called sort of the regional moonshot. It's a lot of funding uh, comparatively for uh, what EDA has been able to fund in the past. And it's a real opportunity uh, to bring together to um, not just the funds, but also the investment priorities, including uh, our priority on equity, on equity. So we want this to be an inclusive opportunity for all communities. May not be relevant to um, all communities, but we are uh, especially focused on uh, coal communities. So these are ones that are transitioning their economies from uh, coal to something else. And we have set aside $100 million through this national challenge to help those communities to diversify. This opportunity um, depends on a, a partnership, a coalition of organizations that are acting in each region. So a, a strong lead institution that's one of those eligible entities will bring together their partners uh, who have um, the ability to implement projects. So the call, there will be a coalition of three to eight organizations that are also eligible to receive EDA grants and can implement different projects, whether that's workforce and uh, maybe a, a industry supply chain plan, uh, maybe that's um, a plan and strategy uh, to, to uh, enhance uh, whatever industry it is. It can be anything from uh, medical supplies, it can be um, AI, uh, AI or um, marine economies. But these will be a coalition, we'll call it, of applicants that come together to apply for this uh, opportunity. And then it's surrounded by all of these important partners, civic and community organizations, certainly, that can help make sure that we are um, engaging uh, all of the community in this opportunity that moves forward. So just quickly run through the rest because I know we're uh, taking up some time. So on the next slide, um, this just highlights what we're looking for here in terms of this Build Back Better Regional Challenge. There's a deadline for this of October 19th. So we are looking for coalitions to form and put in their uh, concept proposals for this uh, that will build on regional assets that bring in strong community and uh, industry leadership that have a sustainable plan for making sure that this um, project will last beyond EDA's funding and that has a strong emphasis on uh, equitable opportunities. And on the next slide, I will just emphasize that we're doing this in a two-phase process. It is a significant investment that we're gonna make. So the first phase is concept proposals that are due October 19th, that's just in a couple of weeks. From that, we'll select 50 to 60 regions across the country to receive um, a $500,000 technical assistance award. And that gives the capacity to really build a strong application. So those uh, finalists will have that $500,000 technical assistance grant to build their coalition and provide um, development of those uh, three to eight projects in their community to submit by March of next year applications for those implementation projects. And then from that, um, by September of next year, we'll select 20 to 30 regions to receive 
between 25 and up to even $100 million to implement their industry cluster strategy. So it's a huge opportunity. And lastly, here's where you find all the information about this. Um, so we have a number of resources here. As Doug said, these slides will be made available. Most of our programs uh, resources here, the, the best page to go to is eda.gov forward slash ARPA for American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, and you will find all the resources. There's webinars for all those six programs. There's FAQs. There's a lot of uh, great applicant resources. Finally, um, how do you how do you uh, get started uh, in in terms of approaching EDA and and finding out more about our resources? One of the best ways is to look for the district organization uh, in your uh, in your region that serves your region and prepares that comprehensive economic development strategy program. They can help you navigate these resources. Um, there are some areas that are not covered by an EDA designated EDD, but they do have economic development organizations that are planning organizations. And if that's the case, if you're in one of these blank spots, we've got 390 of these partners around the country. But if you're in one of these uh, places, and that is the case in some parts of California and the West, for example, the best place to uh, start is to reach out to our EDA uh, regional office state contacts and, and um, they are available to help you navigate that. Uh, we have a resource directory that will tell you where these organizations are, where our regional offices are and how you can get in touch with us. And the next slide, this is um, a quick map too of another resource that we have available, which is our university center partners. EDA has over 64 of these university center partners. They can provide the resources, um, the economic uh, impact uh, and measures, the data that you might need, as well as a lot of technical assistance to help communities to put together applications, but also to implement their projects for economic development. So we uh, recommend that you take a look and find the university center that serves your area and make sure that you have a connection with them for your economic development uh, work. And lastly, here again is our EDA contacts. We've got six regional offices. We have a state representative that serves each one and we have a regional integrator in each office that's part of our team to help bring all these resources together. If you need help, uh, contact us and we will um, help connect you to the right resources. We are at edi at eda.gov. Um, we've got some great links here, um, but we are really uh, focused on making sure that it's easy to navigate our resources. We have a lot more now than we ever did, and we hope that you will uh, check us out and let us help you uh, find the resources that will support your plans. So Dr. Huff, I think it's back to you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nancy and Doug. Those are, really, those are really timely resources that you shared. And um, I, I, I don't know if anyone else heard it, but um, when, when Nancy went over the cluster of participants, doesn't that sound like the Promise Zones? Doesn't that sound like the coalition that the Promise Zones have across the country? So, you know, definitely keep that in mind. And thank you once again for those resources. Um, so now I want to actually turn our focus to uh, additional resources for businesses um, that kind of tie into even some of the things that were covered with the EDA. I want to turn it over to our representative for the Small Business Administration, Heather Luzzi. So with the um, Small Business Administration, we were incepted through the Small Business Act back in 1958. The entire focus of the agency is on small businesses. Now, you may ask, what is the definition of a small business? And truly, it's a little bit different for each sector. So we go off of NAICS codes, or North American Industry Classification System. So for example, um, manufacturing could be up to 1,500 employees. Um, so we would look at that for a, um, a baseline. There's other industries that we would look at perhaps a 500 person cap. And then in a majority of the industries, we look at a revenue cap to make certain that the businesses are not making typically over 15 million in revenue over a three year time frame. So it's a little bit different again for each NAICS code, 
but um, that'll give you a little bit of a, a, an idea. Now, also, I think it's very uh, uh, interesting to note that there are over um, in the United States uh, with respect to small businesses, 99.9% of businesses are considered small under our designations through the Small Business Act. So as you can imagine, um, it's been a little challenging of late for um, us to be supporting these small businesses during the pandemic. You know, initially, um, I don't think any of us anticipated that the pandemic would last as long as it has. So from an agency perspective, we've had to be very nimble and pivot um, several times. With that, um, I wanna point out with respect to the Small Business Administration, when the pandemic hit um, in say January, February of um, 2020, we were an agency of just about 2000 people. At the height of, um, of our employment, bringing on contractors and temporary employees, we ramped up to over 14,000. Um, I think at present we're about 9,000, but that just gives you a, a grasp of the, the gravity of the, the, the situation with the pandemic. Again, our support is specifically to small businesses and clearly many, many of them or a majority of them were shut down during the pandemic. Um, for public safety, et cetera. There were some businesses that were, um, you know, considered um, essential. And so we provided support to those businesses. We've created many new programs through the SBA uh, during the pandemic. And I'll touch on a couple of those. We also have several um, kind of standard programs or flagship programs that the agency has always provided. You may have heard of our disaster assistance um, or economic injury disaster loan. And prior to the pandemic, that particular product was available for businesses that had gone through some type of disaster. So just to give you an example, maybe like a Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, um, flooding, uh, tornadoes, fires, which unfortunately uh, the, the West is, is going through a lot of different fires and disasters in that um, perspective right now. With the pandemic, we pivoted and provided the economic injury disaster loan to businesses across the country and through the US territories. So SBA actually has 68 different district offices throughout the country. There is at least one in every state and uh, Texas and California actually each have six different district offices. Um, New York has three different district offices. And again, it's based on populace. So um, obviously we can't help anybody, everybody. We, we just, we were too small of an agency. So what the great thing is, and I think what we're here talking about today is the different resources. So not only do we want you um, as federal partners to look at SBA as a resource and um, perhaps, you know, uh, engage further and, and come up with, you know, different ways to support communities, but we also have uh, partners that we actually fund or the SBA funds. And I'm gonna go over that as well. So where we're at right now is that um, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan uh, into law on, on March 11th, and he signed the PPP Extension Act. So many of you have heard of um, not only COVID idle, but the Paycheck Protection Program. The Paycheck Protection Program was a great um, program that was uh, enacted through the CARES Act, and that actually provided uh, payroll to small businesses, whether or not the employees were working. So the premise of it was essentially to keep employees off of unemployment so that the, the owners of these businesses were able to support their employees whether or not they were working. And it worked very, very well. We um, uh, had millions and millions of applications. 
we actually could not have done what we did without our um, partners, which are lenders and bankers and CDFIs. And so those entities actually uh, presented the program or facilitated the programs to the small businesses. Now, just to give you an idea, if you're not familiar, SBA is typically not a direct lender. Uh, years and years ago, we did um, uh, a little bit of direct lending where we would underwrite the files in the office and um, provide assistance to CDFIs and, um, and our CDCs uh, or certified development companies. And that changed. And typically, we guarantee loans that lending institutions would make. So we actually mitigate the risk of a lender. We provide this guarantee so that if perhaps they are looking at an applicant that's maybe marginalized on the, the approval and uh, maybe they don't have the credit score that's necessary or um, the down payment that would be necessary in conventional financing, SBA would then step in and provide the guarantee. And the guarantee is actually two lenders. So the PPP program worked essentially the same way. We provided a 100% guarantee to the lending institutions that facilitated the program. When we started PPP, we um, as an agency had about 1,400 lenders across the country. That went up to over 5,500 lenders. And we actually engaged with a lot of FinTech partners. So it really gave us a, an opportunity to reach the masses much more easily. And again, those underserved um, communities, underserved borrowers, those were um, uh, just able to be supported by SBA programs through those lending institutions. When I talked about the economic injury disaster loan or EIDL, that's really the only time that SBA does direct lending is through the disaster division. But in the case of COVID EIDL, um, it became a completely separate program and we provided it to everybody across the country because we um, had declared or the president had declared the entire country as a disaster area. So just wanna give you a little bit of background about that. So with the economic relief programs that we created, again, PPP, that program actually closed as of May 31st. We are now in the forgiveness stage. So what that means is that the um, lending institutions will typically collect the information from the borrowers, the businesses, to make certain that those funds were spent appropriately. Once they submit that, pro that information to SBA, we then review that and provide them back the, um, the guarantee or payment of that loan. The SBA relief um, fund, or it was actually section 1112 of the CARES Act, provided up to six months of principal and interest payments on all SBA uh, transactions. So even new loans coming in, which was a fantastic thing that businesses were in the position, um, few of them, but that they were in the position during the pandemic to actually create a new business or get additional financing, consolidate debt, et cetera, and then have those payments for six months absorbed by the SBA. Unfortunately, um, we are uh, almost out of money on that program. It's set to expire on September uh, 30th. And um, very uh, anybody at this point in time that puts in an application is not going to be eligible for that because of the backlog of applications that we currently have. So um, the next uh, uh, piece of information on that slide was again, that economic injury disaster loan. And that's just been a wonderful, wonderful asset for the agency. We have done a lot of pivoting with that program and we did not anticipate the amount of um, applications that we would get under that program. We got over 19 million applications. So that's just, I mean, incredible. The, um, the agency was not able to uh, process those in some cases in a timely fashion. So we did get a lot of feedback from our um, 
small businesses that they were, you know, um, upset and worried about the ability to um, to sustain their business because it was taking quite a bit of time with respect to the um, the processing of those transactions. At this point in time, though, we've been able to increase those loan amounts up to 500,000. They were originally only 150,000. Then we went up to um, 250,000. Now we're at 500,000 and we just increased those up to 2 million. And again, the reason for these staged increases is that nobody anticipated that this pandemic would last as long as it did. And with the economic injury disaster loan, it was typically looking at six months of working capital for these businesses. We then had to look at up to 24 months of working capital to sustain these businesses because it's gone on so long. So um, this slide that here that you're looking at is actually kind of our flagship programs. These are our um, programs that are typical throughout any year without dealing with that disaster or the PPP program, et cetera. So we provide um, microloans to uh, intermediaries and what they actually do, we provide funding to these intermediaries. What the, the micro lenders do is lend um, from $500 up to $50,000 for small businesses. And a lot of the time these are located um, in promise zone areas and in underserved communities, minority communities, et cetera. Um, it's a great program. We work with partners um, across the um, spectrum with, rep, uh, with respect to how these are actually done. Um, the 7A loan program is actually from 5,000 to $5 million. And um, this particular program is, again, for working capital, commercial real estate. Um, it could be a whole number of things. The, um, the um, 504 program, and oh, and again, the 7A loans are actually facilitated by our lending partners. The 504 loan program is a, um, it is a, CDC or Certified Development Corporation and a lender that partner together to support small businesses in the acquisition or construction of commercial real estate or heavy equipment. In the 504 area, the applicant business only has to come in with 10%. The CDC will do a 40% loan that's guaranteed by SBA and the lender will get a first position lien of only 50%. So it really helps those lending institutions want to um, or be more apt to lend to small businesses because of that first trust um, uh, position. There's a lot of details on the, on the programs on our website. So we've already talked about this um, going up to the, the 2 million. So I'm not going to go through this. But just know that these um, particular programs, especially IDLE, we have amortized those loans for 30 years, and it's at a 3.75% interest rate. The nonprofit is at a 2.75 interest rate. Um, they're fixed, no prepayment penalty, et cetera. We do secure with a UCC um, on uh, business assets, but there is also um, no requirement that the loan be fully collateralized. And that's actually the case on any of our programs. A lot of times lending institutions will um, decline a loan um, because there isn't the collateral to support it. And that's where SBA can step in and be of help to those businesses. Next slide, please. Um, again, we don't need to go through this. I talked a lot about this already. So next slide. And one more. And one more. Okay. So another uh, product that SBA has is that we support um, or, or kind of are the agency that facilitates government contracting opportunities for small businesses. So there is a, a federal mandate that um, requires 
federal entities, federal uh, uh, agencies, to you look at small businesses for their procurement. And the thing that we talk about when we're talking to these small businesses is that the federal government is the world's largest purchaser um, of everything from products to services. So again, we're required by law to uh, look at those particular programs. Um, go to the next slide, Julius. So federal contracting opportunities are um, fantastic. We've got several different ways that we look at these. So we do um, a program called the 8A, which is a business development program. And that's typically for um, entities that would be um, underserved or um, more along the lines of um, not on an even playing field with their competitors. So it's a, actually an eight year program and it's kind of a mentorship program. SBA works with the particular entity for an eight year time frame. And um, the, uh, well, it's actually, it's a nine year time frame, but the, the last year is kind of a transition. So with that said, we assist these businesses by handholding them from start to going off on their own with respect to gaining access to these federal contracting opportunities. We also work a lot with states. So these um, state uh, contractors or uh, procurement officers will often refer um, businesses to us that perhaps would, would meet that 8A criteria. Um, we also uh, work in the hub zone area. So companies that are in hub zones are, uh, they have another program for hub zone. And it again, uh, supports those contracting opportunities. There is a set aside for women owned small businesses as well as service disabled veteran um, owned businesses. Next slide, please. So here's where I think that um, you may, gain some additional knowledge about SBA and how we kind of operate. Clearly, I told you at the beginning of the presentation that we were a very, very small agency and, um, and quite frankly, still are in the scheme of things. But we have this resource partner network that is funded by SBA dollars, and they're essentially kind of our boots on the ground. They assist us in deploying our programs, in uh, talking to small businesses, in getting those businesses financials together, packaging um, transactions to be lender ready, et cetera. So I'll go through those quickly. And what we have is the Small Business Development Centers or SBDC network. We also have the Women's Business Centers. So the Women's Business Centers are also served um, or also serve uh, all genders. The, they're not just for women, although that is their main focus. Um, and then the Veterans Business Outreach Centers. Those are uh, entities that are specific to veterans and supporting them in getting um, back to you know, civilian life. We also do a program called Boots to Business. And that is for um, active military members that are transitioning to civilian life. And it's a mandate from um, the military that they have to go through these, um, the, this course, this transition course, and SBA plays a big part of that. SCORE mentors and volunteers, although they're not listed here, um, SCORE is, or used to be, a Senior Corps of Retired Executives. And that's an entity, again, across the country that provides services uh, and education and technical assistance for small businesses at no cost. All of these entities support businesses at no cost because of the federal funding. Um, they're a great, great asset to the agency and truly we could not do what we do without them. Next slide. So, uh, there's been a lot of unfortunate incidents with respect to um, fraud and how that um, has happened through the pandemic. Um, be on the lookout because a lot of times we'll get uh, inquiries from small businesses saying, 
you know, I'm not sure that this is real. It says it came from SBA, but, you know, is it is it legitimate? And um, oftentimes we'll look at it and it'll say SBA.com. And clearly that's, you know, not legitimate. Unfortunately, scammers are, um, this is just a prime opportunity for them to take advantage of businesses, even during the worst of times. So we uh, have set up different hotlines and websites and, and work with our um, Office of Inspector General, and uh, we, we have prosecuted many cases um, of fraud on this and are still in the process of doing so. An unfortunate circumstance, but um, it's, it's unfortunately a byproduct of um, the millions and millions of loans that we have provided. And last slide, please. So these are basically different um, contacts. And um, with respect to, I know a lot of you are scattered throughout the country. The, the 800 numbers are for anywhere in the country. The um, district offices, the best way to find the district office local to you um, would be through sba.gov forward slash local assistance. And you can find a contact within the district office to partner with. We always welcome those partnerships. I think um, earlier, uh, I can't remember uh, whether it was Nancy or Doug that mentioned uh, Melinda Matson, and she's here in Northern California, and we do um, work with her and EDA on, um, on several things, and it's just a great partnership. Uh, we work with a lot of the federal agencies, but we always welcome the opportunity to get our products and services out to more businesses and to educate the general public about what we are able to offer. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you so much, Heather. Um, we really appreciate it. And definitely um, the resources that you shared are really valuable. And um, um, we will, we're gonna actually, uh, and also and to Nancy for the resources that were shared by the EDA. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and launch into and take some questions. And um, Heather, if you wanna, Hold up the puppy in the background so we can see who our friend is. That's cool too. Um, so I'll, I'll do that as soon as she comes back in. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and um, um, look and see what questions. If you don't, if you haven't put anything in the chat, you can go ahead and place your questions in the chat right now. Um, I do see one question that I'll go ahead and uh, uh, start with. Um, we have a question for the EDA. Um, from Sandy, one of our, our team members. And the question is, um, so it, it's kind of looking at um, some of the regional partners have, have kind of shied away from submitting the Build Back Better application because the state is planning to apply. Um, how can we encourage all ideas going forward, um, you know, when you're competing with your own state? Any comments or thoughts on that, um, Doug or Nancy? Uh, I can offer maybe one or two quick comments. Nancy actually works very closely uh, to support this program from headquarters and expect she has more to say. Um, coordination is typically the name of the game when it comes to uh, applying for and implementing projects with EDA support. So in cases where a regional coalition feels as though they're being kind of crowded out by the uh, possibility of the, the state coming in with an application build back better, um, perhaps it is worthwhile for parties uh, from either coalition to uh, collaborate with each other and kind of understand what are the differences between uh, their applications and how they might, um, you know, apply in, in support of each other, so to speak, so that they're applications kind of reflect each other's uh, vision for economic growth, or maybe it's possible for the regional coalition to join with the state applicant. Um, but uh, Nancy, what, what are your thoughts and perspectives on this question? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think one that um, that is very relevant to the challenge. The state is definitely um, an important partner in these regional growth clusters, but they are regional growth clusters. So uh, the leadership, the community leadership, the industry leadership, and the local um, entities that will be implementing the projects 
really do belong to um, a region. Uh, however, that footprint is developed is designed uh, to support the industry cluster that you're targeting. So as Doug mentioned, it is important for regions to be um, in good uh, conversation and coordination with the states that are supporting, uh, that can support those regional growth clusters in, in any way. They may be an applicant, they may be an applicant for one of the component projects, there may be a regional lead organization or institution that makes good sense. Um, there is um, an element to these regional growth clusters that is place-based to be sure um, in terms of creating um, a platform for synergies, for knowledge exchange, for innovation, for competitiveness of that um, industry sector in that region and to really build upon the local talent, the suppliers that is there that makes that important and valuable uh, as an economic diversification and a growth strategy. So I would say that um, we've seen this model, you know, it's competitive. There's only gonna be 20 to 30 of these winners at the end of the day, um, 50 to 60 uh, regions that'll be finalists, but you can kind of do the calculus and see that we're looking for geographic diversification. So it does make sense to try to um, work with the state, work with the other partners, especially in the same uh, industry sector, to find out um, how you can all make a regional growth cluster as strong as it can be uh, building on those um, good talents that the Promise Zone partners have had for coalition building and working together across diverse um, institutions to make uh, their region or place uh, competitive in a global level. So I would say, yeah, as Doug said, um, have those conversations now, um, put together the strong application. Um, we may see more than one come in from a, a given state, but um, definitely we'll be looking at the power of the, the leadership and the diversity of those um, institutions that are part of that um, coalition application. I hope that answers a little bit. Yeah, thank you. So Nancy, um since uh, Doug mentioned you work with the field uh, more, um, are there like one or two examples of projects that have been, um, you know, that, that you can give to the audience? Yeah, I mean, in general, I think there's a couple that we would, we would highlight to give a sense of how EDA can be really flexible in terms of um, supporting these uh, bottom-up and locally-led economic development strategies. I mean, just to pick up on um, Heather's, um, resources from the SBA, one of the things that EDA re recently did in, in Sacramento area under the CARES Act was um, provide capitalization for a revolving loan fund that's being administered there. First $500,000, then $2.2 million. And so those resources are really available to help support entrepreneurship, um, to sustain uh, local businesses. We featured um, a similar sort of revolving loan fund uh, project in one of EDA's recent newsletters that was in Detroit in this case, but it helped um, to sustain and support um, a cosmetology business uh, training program actually, so that those, those folks could continue on their journey, um, the people in that community uh, to, to learn those skills and start their own businesses. So that's the kind of thing that we can do through the revolving loan fund. I would also point out, you know, I know Philadelphia is one of the promise zones. We made a, um, an award just real recently under one of our um, Build to Scale programs, which is an innovation and entrepreneurship program. Again, um, that one is, it's called Building Understanding of Lab Basics Program. So this is sort of workforce related, and that's one of the investment priorities that Doug mentioned that we are really um, focusing on now, but this one will provide um, virtual training skills uh, in biotech, which is an, an industry sector in Philadelphia that's booming there, but maybe doesn't have the strong connections to the neighborhoods that need them around that innovation district. So this is trying to make that bridge um, for STEM programs for people who live in those communities that have long been distressed and not participating in the growth of that sector. So that's um, the kind of project that we wanna see that we wanna work on with our economic development partners. But we've done all kinds of infrastructure projects as well. So we might be building a workforce training center. We might be putting um, equipment to train people in industry um, growth opportunities, sort of you know medical simulation labs or 
uh, things like that at a local university. Water sewer systems and roads, those are really our bread and butter, but that can, um, that can be the, the foundation for um, communities to be able to attract uh, private investment and to attract the jobs that are at quality wages that they can do. So those are just kind of a couple of the, the recent examples and just really the foundational investments that we make to um, the regional organizations that develop those comprehensive economic development strategies. We gave a $200,000 award to Valley Vision, uh, again, in the Sacramento area to build out their comprehensive strategy in response to the pandemic. And that's an opportunity for community organizations and participants and promise zones and elsewhere to get their goals and objectives included in that long-term five-year strategy for growth in a region. So those are some of the planning, infrastructure, workforce. Uh, we run the gamut. Um, I wanted to add that um, I've shared a link in the chat space to um, a, pay, a page on the EDI website. It's EDI in the news. And so far the, the primary coverage we're receiving is for the various regional economic diversification summits that our team has helped to facilitate and plan and also in which we've participated. And uh, these various articles from local and regional newspapers and uh, TV news um, really help uh, readers understand um, what EDA is helping uh, to organize with respect to accessing a variety of federal program resources to support local and regional uh, priorities and objectives, both in the specific economic development space, but also more broadly in community development as well, because there's clearly a relationship between um, economic growth and community vitality. And so just invite everybody to visit the EDI in the news uh, webpage. As another example, um, with respect to the REDS that will be held today in uh, Goldendale, Washington that Nancy mentioned earlier, Francis Sakaguchi, the Seattle Regional Office uh, Integration Staff Person, informs us that in addition to her participation on behalf of EDA, that this event will also include participants from EPA, HUD, USDA Rural Development, USDA Rural Utility Services, FEMA, Department of Energy, and uh, Department of Commerce, uh, Information, and uh, NTIA. So um, there's really no um, limit on uh, which agencies uh, that we'll partner with. It really has to do with uh, what the priorities and objectives are for your community, your region, our integration team can work with you to understand which federal and other resources are the best fit for what you aspire to accomplish and help establish those productive relationships. Thank you, Doug. Um, thank you, that, that, that REDS event sounds really like something we'd like to share out as well. Um, one last question for EDA and then we'll go to SBA. Um, what doesn't EDA fund? What, what <laughs> Um, and I understand the construction, the buildings, and other infrastructure. What are uh, things that EDA doesn't fund? Well, you'll recall earlier during uh, Nancy's comments, she discussed how EDA is prohibited under statute from making grants or otherwise providing assistance directly to private individuals or to for-profit organizations. So regardless of the activity of the project or how worthwhile Doug Lineot might happen to be as a private individual, you know, that we're just simply not gonna make grants in that respect. In terms of grants that are made to eligible applicants and recipients, um, you know, before ARPA, there were definitely some activities where EDA uh, tended to kind of defer to some of our federal partners and work with them to kind of fill those specific gaps. So as an example, I will cite, you know, workforce development. And therefore in cases where an applicant was seeking that kind of assistance, EDA's grants were limited to uh, maybe the construction of the site where workforce development courses would be offered 
but in terms of curriculum and, and development and materials and things like that, the Department of Labor was the more appropriate federal partner uh, to, to provide that kind of assistance. Under ARPA and through EDA's uh, Good Jobs Challenge, the portfolio of activities that EDA is now funding through that program has expanded beyond its kind of traditional footprint in that space. And we are able to uh, contemplate and make awards to uh, projects, including curriculum development and, and other kinds of things that labor has traditionally funded. So uh, I would say that broadband infrastructure is another type of investment. And it is not that EDA um, doesn't fund uh, the development of broadband infrastructure and the costs associated with that, but it has been really EDA's preference to make those types of awards where the broadband infrastructure activity was part of a broader kind of job creation, business creation uh, strategy and not a standalone activity. Uh, it is possible that under ARPA, EDA may take um, a more expansive view towards those types of activities. Um, Nancy, do you have other examples you'd like to cite? Um, I guess I would just say, you know, clearly we certainly don't want to uh, suggest that we can fund the same things that, for example, HUD would do. So we don't do affordable housing. Um, we don't uh, generally do uh, community facilities that are um, government oriented. So we wouldn't fund a government building, for example, that's used for community purposes. But community facilities is something that we often do referrals, uh, you know, buying the fire truck and things like that in rural areas to USDA. They have a lot of resources for those purposes. So um, we, you know, we do cross referrals for things that we cannot do. Um, we have not funded a lot of, um, you know, individual development accounts. We can't do things of that nature. So that's where we rely on um, partners like HUD uh, to do things like that. And um, I think that, you know, it's, it's really more the economic development, job creation is uh, private investment. Those are sort of our two uh, basic metrics. So if it's building the conditions for economic development, um, talk to us about it. If it is um, working more with individuals and families on the needs that they have, then probably we can um, suggest other partners in the federal space that would be um, better suited to that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Doug and Nancy. Um, I wanna pivot a little bit uh, to a question for, the, for Heather with SBA. Um, Heather, uh, could you talk to us a little bit more about the, the hub zone and how it works with um, employers and employees and as far as the zone is related? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so thank you, that's a great question. With hub zone, um, hub zone are you know, specifically designated areas and what we do is support those businesses um, with um, offers to uh, you know, provide uh, technical assistance with access to opportunities through um, state or, or local um, contracting. We do make sure, so if the, if the entity itself, if the business itself is located in a hub zone area, then that part's great. But if a majority of the employees that work for that company are located in a hub zone, then they're again, eligible. So it's, um, we, we try to make it very um, easy to work with in those areas and support those underserved communities. Um, again, with uh, hub zone, we do um, weekly newsletters and uh, updates uh, for those. All of that information can be found on SBA's website. You can sign up for those newsletters. There are um, specific certifications that have to take place with the specific business entity. And uh, those are uh, attested to yearly. We do yearly site visits to make certain that those um, uh, entities are you know, complying with federal law. Um, it's, it's a great program and there's not a lot of, I mean, you don't have to worry about the number of employees or the, the revenue of the entity or anything along those lines that would be traditionally required with SBA programs. Um, we want to support those underserved communities and whether the 
the actual business is located there or their employees are located there, it's terrific. Thank you, thank you, Heather. Um, I'm, it, it's very interesting. It would be uh, interesting to see kind of uh, with the promise zones and the hub zones, you know, um, I'm wondering, is there a map or anything that shows that color? There is, that we do have hub zone maps and there is a lot of overlay. Um, honestly, it, it's it's not exact, but I'm happy to get you that information and perhaps you could share that with our, our federal partners. Excellent, that's perfect. Um, we have, you know, the, the, the Promise Zone partners um, across the country would be very interested in taking a look at that, I'm sure. Um, I don't see any other questions and um, looks like we're a little bit ahead of time, but um, I wanna thank um, both um, Heather with uh, the SBA and um, Nancy and Doug with the EDA for, you know, really, I think launching us in a, in a great way for the first day, um, you know, with some great resources. You know, I think that um, uh, our, our uh, people who are participated today, but also will see this recording, will be really interested in taking advantage of these resources. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you.